heavy metals, and persistent organic pollutants. So let me, let me lay out the foundation uh, of this story before we get started. So while I've you know, been an asiopathic doctor, of course, I've been always aware of the issue of uh, toxicity. Um, but while I had some knowledge in that area, it wasn't really very deep. And I had an interesting thing happen. About four years ago, the, uh, one of the wealthiest men in Canada approached me and said he wanted to improve the health of his employees. Now, his employees are oil field workers. Okay? And he had been doing uh, pretty traditional conventional uh, uh, wellness programs for almost 10 years at this point with fairly mediocre, mediocre results. So he said, I, I want you to do a really sophisticated program. And so I said to him, well, how open are you? He says, I'm open to everything. You can, you can give them vitamins if you want to. Well, I said, that's fine. <laughs> and, uh, and then I said, well, you know, can I do some lab tests? Now, as some of you may know, I've developed a company called Cellugenesis, where I develop artificial intelligence tools that both doctors and consumers can use to help assess their health and improve their health. And he said, we, we, we would use that. And I also said, I want to do some lab tests. And um, would you give me a budget? He said, blank check. I said, well, wait a minute, a blank check. Now, this is a man who's self-made, one of the wealthiest men in Canada. And uh, he's self-made, and he lives, he lives in a nice house, but I've been in much fancier houses. He basically gives away most of his money every year. So he decided he wants to give it away to help improve the health of his employees. So he's paying for it out of pocket. So I then ended up basically doing about the retail equivalent of $1,500 of lab tests per person every year, okay, on 4,000 oil field workers and their families. So the, the exciting thing about this is not only was I able to apply naturopathic medicine principles, you know, get into the body what it needs, nutrition, get out of the body what it doesn't need, toxins. I was able to actually measure people, do the interventions, and see what happened. So my perspectives on things are going to be a little different from other clinicians uh, uh, for, for two reasons. One is I got to do kind of the same thing on a large number of people to see what happens. So that's the good part. The bad part is this is group therapy, not not real individualized. So I think you get better results with individualized therapy. So what I'm saying, this doesn't necessarily apply to everybody, but I've got some pretty good data now. So now, also one of the good things about this is that I got to really spend a lot of time looking at the research. So while um, only a part of my lecture today will be about mercury, I looked at about 2,000 articles on mercury. Now those who know me have been my students know I, I don't exaggerate. I really looked at 2,000 articles. I read 2,000 articles on mercury. So I really understand mercury very, very well right now. But we're, and so I actually have an hour and a half lecture just on mercury. But today we're going to talk about persistent organic pollutants and, and heavy metals. So I'm basically going to talk about the uh, prevalence and the sources of these toxins. I'll talk about what they do in the body, how they damage the body, uh, what, their, uh, what the clinical impl implications are, how you assess these toxins, and then what to do about it. Okay, so let's start with the POPs, the persistent organic pollutants. So this is a term that's now being used in the uh, conventional medical research to kind of, kind of a grab bag uh, description of all these chemical toxins we're exposed to. So while I do have a list of here of various chemical names, I'll read off a few of them, the, the reality is that this is kind of all the chemical toxins. So solvents, pesticides, herbicides, uh, the, the whole, whole group of things. So you have things like the PCBs, the polychlorinated biphenyls, the organochlorine uh, pesticides, the polybrominated diphenyl esters, the plasticizers, all these phthalates we hear about, um, dioxins, uh, polychlorinated dioxins, uh, polychlorinated dibenzofuranes, um, all these long names, organophosphate pesticides. In general, I'm going to use the initials, not the long names, because I tend to stumble over them when I start talking faster and faster. So one thing I've learned, which has been a surprise to me, is that it turns out that our primary source of exposure to these chemical toxins is actually the foods we eat. Now, it's not necessarily only the foods we eat, but the packages the foods are in. And it turns out that the dosages that we're exposed to are clinically relevant. So there's actually strong, clear disease correlations, which I'll be telling you about. And the instance of exposure, uh, NHANES, the third NHANES study looked at a 49 persistent organic pollutants and found that um, uh, at least 60% of the population had at least 20 of them, and uh, over 80% of the population had measurable levels of at least one, at least one of them. Uh, the, some of them are not real common, like tesachlorobenzene, uh, found only in 0.6%, whereas DD was found in virtually everybody that was, that was tested. So these things are widespread in our environment. One of the challenges with the POPs, and I think one reason why the recognition of their clinical significance has been so delayed, is that due to their varying chemical structures, they have a, a diversity of effects in the body. So it's not like if you have high level POP exposure, you get one disease. 
Now, it turns out diabetes has extremely strong correlation, diabetes and heart disease, but in general, it, it, it affects a wide range of things. So, for example, you get a lot of hormonal hormone effects. Uh, for example, some of these things interfere with and or mimic insulin. Uh, a lot of endocrine effects, particularly thyroid, testosterone, and estrogen. Lots of mimicking effects, effects there, and also poison and thyroid uh, activity. Mitochondrial damage. You know, what's one of the most common reasons why people come to see doctors today? It's fatigue, right? Well, fatigue is often because of mitochondrial dysfunction. Mitochondrial dysfunction is much more common in our society than we realize, and one reason for that is pure chemical, sense of chemical exposure. Inflammatory cytokines. We have a lot of inflammation in our society today. It turns out that uh, exposure to these things upregulate inflammatory cytokines. Alteration in DNA activity, uh, upregulation of, of PPARs, stimulation of tumor necrosis factor, and in particular, intrauterine effect and epigenetic effects. Now, this is really scary. So, for example, infants with high cord levels of hexachlorobenzene have a twofold increased risk for, for obesity in childhood. So, a term that's now being used for these POPs in the research literature is not just us weird nature paths. It's in the research literature. You're seeing uh, obesogens and diabetogens are terms that are now, now being used. Okay, so, the, the, the research is, is growing. And, it's really, and a lot of it, it's actually very, very recent. Just the last 10 years is really the research just started to blow up on this. So, one of the big challenges with things is that, with these things, is that while clearly there's a dose dependent uh, relationship, there's also some threshold things. And so while we say, yes, the person has exposure, it's not clear with the POPs at what level you start getting clinically significant effects. So it's kind of like the more the worse, but there's a huge genetic variation in susceptibility and also ability to detox, detoxify these things. But we'll look at them all together, kind of a grab bag. What you see is, in particular, you see cardiovascular effects and you see, uh, and you see uh, insulin effects. So it's kind of the two big areas. And probably the third big area is going to be the, uh, uh, the hormonal effects. So clearly, the, uh, um, the, uh, the epidemic we're seeing today in obesity and diabetes may largely be due to not just simple carbohydrates in the diet, but due to pop exposure. It's quite, quite interesting. And I'll show you some data on that. It's really interesting. OK, neuroendocrine effects. Um, <clears throat> here's a study that showed that um, chlorinated uh, dioxins and dibenzofuranes, the increased incidence of uh, attention deficit disorder in children. Uh, they find that the more of these things in the kids, the more attention dis uh, deficit disorders you get. Insulin resistance, very strong association with a wide range, with 19 of the POPs, with basically insulin resistance. And as you, these are what these chemicals look like. Uh, uh, this particular ca class of, uh, of pesticides, and basically the uh, more the pesticides, the more the insulin resistance. And when you add uh, waist circumference to the POP levels, you get a very, very high level of of uh, predictability as to the level of insulin resistance the person has. Diabetes and POPs. Now, this is very, very critical information. There is found that those in the highest quintile of POP exposure for just six POPs have a 38-fold increased risk for diabetes. If you take people who are fat, we all know obesity, diabetes, right? Direct correlation. Person's obese, they have diabetes. You take obese people, Look at those in the top quartile compared to those in the low, lowest quartile. Those in the lowest quartile of, di of, of POPs with obesity don't get diabetes. Conversely, skinny people, those in the top quartile of POPs get diabetes, and those in the lowest quartile of POPs don't get diabetes. So I'll say that again. Without POPs, it looks like you don't get diabetes. Fascinating stuff. Now, there's other factors involved, chromium deficiency, you know, too much sugar, all those things. I want to say I'm not, I'm not ignoring those things, but I'm going to assert to you it may be that POPs are actually even more relevant uh, than those other factors that we've known, uh, known all along. Very, very, very fascinating and disconcerting. So you can just start looking at the, at the research, and there's just lots and lots of research uh, going, showing that um, POPs at low levels, even at low levels, clearly induce insulin resistance. And of course, you get insulin resistance before you get measurable increases in, uh, in uh, uh, blood sugar levels and uh, increased resistance to the uh, insulin, insulin. Yes? Is that all true for type 1 diabetes as well? Um, my, my assumption is probably not because, I mean, I, I should put it this way. So you, yes, you would expect the increased insulin resistance in type 1 diabetes as well. 
Yes, no question about it. Okay, but this is where all this data I'm showing is all type two diabetes. 